history-making 2011 Daytona 500. Trouble to a huge crash. 2448 Powell Bowl slamming into each other. My, my, my. Powell into Michael. The brand new surface at Daytona has led to a new style of racing. The bump and push style of drafting is now possible at Daytona due to this smooth surface. Now, see the monumental rebuild of Daytona International Speedway from the ground up. This will probably be the most talented job I've done this far. 50,000 tons of hot asphalt. We can make it faster and they can lay it, and you'll see that out here. Sheer 31-degree banks. You get one little rock underneath your shoe, and you're going to slide to the bottom because it's very steep. And just six months to get it done. We have to go 24-7. We will do whatever it takes to be ready because there is no backup plan. Daytona International Speedway. A track rebuilt for traction, rebuilt for endurance, and rebuilt for speed. Speedmakers, Daytona. Daytona International Speedway. To NASCAR fans, this is sacred and hallowed ground. When you think about the birth of NASCAR, it started here in Daytona. It's the biggest, it's the best, it's what makes NASCAR special. Ever since its construction in 1958, this track has been home to NASCAR's most important race, the Daytona 500. The 500 is just, you know, it's, it's our biggest race of the year. It's the first race of the year. It kicks off the year. Uh, there's two things on my list of things that I really want to get done before I retire. One of them is win a championship, the other one is win a Daytona 500. And an amazing finish! For over a half century, this asphalt has recorded some of NASCAR's most unforgettable moments. 20 years of trying, 20 years of frustration. Dale Earnhardt will come to the caution flag to win the Daytona 500. And some of its most heart-wrenching tragedies. How about Dale? Is he okay? Schrader has climbed out of his car. He and Earnhardt have crashed together. This storied pavement may look as smooth as an average highway, but decades of intense competition delivered a lot of abuse. For years, crew chiefs like 2011 Daytona 500 winning team leader Donnie Wingo specially calibrated their cars to handle Daytona's battered surface couldn't quite be as hard or as low on the front yet the bumps were so big that you know you had to actually put spring in the car seeing the track degrade for decades it became obvious something had to be done a plan was set to repave Daytona in 2012 but during the 2010 race the track made it clear it had other plans and some of the asphalt has come up yeah, see, it's flying all the pieces right there. Daytona was literally falling apart. We were preparing the plans for a repaved job. Unfortunately, this just accelerated that opportunity. Probably about a two-year jump on getting it done. In 1978, a new layer of asphalt on top of the original 20-year-old surface was enough to repair the aging track. But by 2010, the structural flaws of Daytona's pavement were way too deep to smooth over. Fixing it would be a massive undertaking, something never done in the history of the track. Removing every inch of existing asphalt down to the lime rock base underneath and putting down a new four-layer surface. To tackle this monumental project, Daytona and its parent company, International Speedway Corporation, turned to Lane Construction, a national large-scale construction firm that knows how to get big jobs done on time 
and on budget. We are heavy civil contractors. We do highways, bridges, airports, runways. They're also the premier racetrack pavers in the U.S., taking on jobs like Richmond, Darlington, and Talladega. We brought in the exact same crew that worked Talladega. We wanted people who were experienced in high bakes. We know they've done a good job. And we're only going to put the best people on the Daytona International Speedway. Still, every raceway is a challenge, and Daytona would be no different. Second only to Talladega, its 31-degree banks are some of the steepest in the sport. That's the challenge of keeping everything up there and still be able to pave it and pave it smooth. To understand the mammoth task, it helps to understand the track. Daytona International Speedway is a tri-oval design, referring to its triangular shape with rounded oval-like edges. It has five bank turns, four at 31 degrees, and an 18 degree bank at the start-finish line. Adding to the complexity of the build, Daytona's big. It's NASCAR's second longest super speedway, a two and a half mile loop. With such a long track, cars build up so much speed that NASCAR requires race teams at Daytona to install restrictor plates on their engines. Known to NASCAR fans as plate races, cars are kept below 200 miles per hour to avoid life-threatening accidents. But even at this controlled speed, any problem in the track pavement could be catastrophic. To get it done in time would take precision planning and a massive engineering effort in six stages. Demolition, removing the existing surface. Surveying, using tools to calculate where the track is at and where it needs to be. Grading, digging and filling in earth to perfectly match Daytona's original dimensions. Priming, protecting and prepping the exposed dirt substrate Paving, laying down layer upon layer of fresh, hot asphalt. And finally, testing, ensuring the new racetrack's ready for serious speed. The cost to complete this project? $20 million. And it all had to be done by January 1st, 2011. That's less than six months. July 13th, 2010. The first step of construction? Demolition, stripping the track down to the bare lime rock base. To get it started, Daytona International Speedway holds a ceremonial groundbreaking with two Daytona 500 champions, brothers Darrell and Michael Waltrip. Now, I just want to tell y'all something. I don't know how far this thing's going to come around. <laughs> you might want to back up. Darrell was the Daytona 500 champion in 1989. A NASCAR commentator now retired from racing. Returning to this pavement brings back a lot of memories. The Daytona 500 belongs to Franklin, Tennessee's Darrell Waltrip. He's done it. He's done it. I have a hundred flashbacks of things that, that go through my mind. I, I see myself standing in victory circle. Uh, you know, with the trophy that I just won. Uh, I see myself being hauled out of here on a stretcher. Darrell Waltrip tumbling down the backstretch. What appears to be a very, very serious crash. Joe Russell, the other car. His brother and two-time Daytona champion, Michael Waltrip, steps into the excavator and gets to work breaking ground on the historic project. You're not going to find many two-time Daytona 500 champions that can operate a, a piece of equipment like this with the precision. Delicately, slowly we turn. The bucket opens. And out of the bucket comes a large chunk of history. The Walter brothers step down and Lane Construction takes over demolishing the turns. On the banks, gravity does the job of bringing down the old pavement so it can be scooped up. But for the flat parts of the track, a different technique is needed. Coming up, 
a mega machine with an endless appetite for asphalt. And later, building racetrack perfection takes a lot of muscle and a lady's sensitive touch. In a half inch, a quarter of an inch, it's just all very touchy, very slight of hand. You do too much and you dig a hole. August 2010. For the first time ever, Daytona International Speedway's legendary two and a half mile tri-oval is being completely excavated and repaved. But this track has seen new pavement before, and each time, a new surface generates an epic race. <laughs> When you look back in the past as it relates to the finishes we've had under new asphalt, it's pretty phenomenal. February 22nd, 1959. The first ever Daytona 500 is too close to call. It was a three wide finish that they couldn't determine the winner for a couple days after the race. On race day, the trophy goes to Johnny Beauchamp. But careful analysis reveals Lee Petty's the actual winner by less than a yard. Twenty years later, the track's original surface is paved over. And the first Daytona 500 on the new pavement proves to be just as thrilling. It looks like it's headed for another photo finish. Two of the greatest fiddling here, fidgeting with first place. Donnie Allison and Cale Yarborough are neck and neck. Donnie Allison in first. Where will Kale make his move? He comes from the inside. Donnie Allison throws the block. Kale hits him. He slides. Donnie Allison flies. They hit again. They climb up the turn. They're hitting the wall. They're head on the wall. They slide down the inside. But who is going to win it? Petty is out in front. Richard Petty slips past. After the race, an infamous fist fight breaks out between Donnie's brother, Bobby Allison, and Cale Yarborough. And what a bitter defeat. But another of Daytona's most memorable races is also one of its most infamous. Right in the middle of the 2010 Daytona 500, a dangerous situation develops in the middle of the aging track. And some of the asphalt has come up. Yeah, it's right on the first paving line at the top of that line. Uh, so it's about, what, 14 feet off the yellow line? Yeah, it sounds like a real bad spot. At speeds pushing 200 miles per hour, hitting a giant pothole could cause a major accident. So the race has been red flagged. The cars have been brought down pit road. There's an NASCAR official stationed at each car. Track engineers rush to repair the 18-inch hole. I applaud NASCAR for making a quick repair because it could affect the outcome of the 500 if they didn't. Meanwhile, more than 150,000 fans are left idling in the stands. We're told that the uh, track safety workers had to lay down a patch in a second area. It takes more than an hour and a half to finish the patch. The race begins again, but not for long. Oh, boy. Yeah, see, it's flying all the pieces right there. The hole is growing. Desperate to finish the race, engineers come up with a new plan. The second patch was Bondo, which is an automotive finishing product that was used to fill the hole, and we were able to complete the race. In the end, fans are rewarded with a spectacular finish. Jamie McMurray wins. But the race took over six hours the longest Daytona 500 in history. Whether it's a highway or a parking lot, it eventually gets to the end of its useful life by the time it comes to repave the track. Just one more race, the 2010 Coke Zero 400 would take place on the old pavement. All remaining races were canceled in preparation for the major overhaul. Once this race is over, 50,000 tons of asphalt will replace what the drivers are racing on tonight. It's a lot of history removed. 
Kevin Harvick, the race leader. He's Casey coming. Kane and Jeff Gordon behind him. Will they make the a move? Start they the will not. The Harvick the wins at yeah. Daytona. August 30th, 2010. Lane Construction has finished demolishing the steep 31 degree turns with excavators. Now, for flat sections of the speedway, like this section at Pitt Road, it's time to use a more precise tool, a mechanized monster pavement eater called the milling machine. This is a seven foot 2100 working mill. We're taking off just asphalt for right now here on Pitt Road. Digging up to 11 inches deep, the milling machine's one of the slowest vehicles to ever grace the speedway. But what it lacks in speed, it makes up for in raw power. It's got a seven foot head on it. It's a big drum and it's got teeth on it. There's 185 on this machine. Here's how it works. The rotating teeth rip the pavement into bite-sized pieces. Then the machine picks up the pavement, routes it onto a conveyor, and the conveyor dumps it into a waiting truck. At its slow rate, one 1,600-foot pass on Pitt Road can seem like an eternity. But jobs like Daytona have a way of keeping you on your toes. It changes every 10 feet, the depth. So I have to pace myself to make sure I'm not leaving my ground man. So it makes it a lot harder on me. Finally, the demolition crew's work is done. A big first step toward building a newer, better Daytona. But the project has a long way to go, and just six months to get it completed. Yet hitting the deadline isn't the only concern. Respecting Daytona's original dimensions and geometry is critical to future competition. We take great care in making sure that we're putting the asphalt back in to the exact degree and measurement that it was when we took it out because we want to make sure when someone wins the Daytona 500, it compares to all the other past winners who've won it before. To create an exact replica of the original racetrack, Lane's moving on to stage two. Surveying, using sophisticated tools to map out Daytona's precise measurements. My guys are going around here taking shots and letting them know, is it too low, is it too high, or what they've got to do to it to get ready for the next layer. To do it, surveyors use a set of intelligent tools, the surveyor pole, and the robot. The lens of the robot is at a fixed elevation and a known horizontal position. Then you turn around to this pole over here, and the robot can find out from the tip of the rod where it is relative to the design surface of the track. And that's how this system works. The team has their work cut out for them. Using millions of reference points, they constantly collect critical data for the next stage of construction, grading, turning computer measurements into raceway reality. Coming up, stop down. The repaving project hits a snag. When your mechanic is busy, then that's not a good sign on these jobs. Now we're hung up somewhere. And later, constructing a road built to take abuse. What we have is a lot of lateral forces where the car wants to slide up the banking, so we need to be able to resist that lateral shear. August 2010. At Daytona International Speedway, Lane Construction's gone hammer down. Speeding to finish the new track in true Daytona 500 style. Pushing it to the very limit. A will to win familiar to NASCAR fans. Almost, he almost squeezed Harvick into the wall. February 18th, 2007. In the final lap, approaching turn three. Mark Martin's out in front. But things can change very quickly. And they're going to slag back a little bit. Is he going to get help? Is he going to come? He's looking. Feeling the pressure from Kyle Busch, Martin moves inside, opening the door for Kevin Harvick. Here comes Harvick, the 29. Harvick's getting the run off turn four. It's going to be a drag race all the way back to the start-finish line. In a frenzy to the finish, 
all hell breaks loose. Big crash, here they come, checkered flag, Harvick! Harvick. Kevin Harvick wins the Daytona 500. The remaining cars crashing and spinning barrel over the start finish line. One way or another. We got one car on still his roof coming across the start finish they're line. Still right here. They're wrecking everywhere. Look at this finish. An amazing end to one of the last epic races on the old track. But with a little help from lane construction, Daytona's entering a new era with fresh pavement. August 31st, 2010. The construction crews cleared a third of their own race, demolishing the old pavement and surveying the track to measure its dimensions. Now, using these measurements, the crew gets to work on step three, grading, adding and removing earth to create a solid foundation for layers of pavement. Flat surfaces are shimmed and smoothed by conventional graders, but the sloped turns require a different method. To grade the steep 31 degree banks, lane construction turns to a monster digging machine with a feminine touch, named Cherise. The challenge is that half of it's only, sometimes, I mean, a half inch, a quarter of an inch. I mean, it's just all, all in the hand movements. She's good. Better than most of the guys out here. Better than most of the guys I've ever seen. It's just very, very touchy, very slight of hand. You do too much and you dig a hole. Not enough and you don't dig enough. The grading is done in partnership with a man on the ground. After I finish grading this, he's going to take that six foot level. He'll make sure I have 1.68. That's the top of my finish line rock, and that's, that's great. I won't have to go no deeper. With the lime rock base set to the right height, the next crew moves in to seal the deal. A step called priming. Primer is critical to a Daytona 500 worthy pave job. We're getting ready to pave tomorrow. This is like a bonding agent, okay? It helps the asphalt bond to, to the lime rock. It also holds the lime rock together to keep it from, like if we get a rain shower tonight, uh, it keeps it from washing because we've had several nights of rain and we have to come in and redo a lot of spots. And we're really tired of doing that. We want to get some asphalt on this. There's 98 Joe Rutman in the second place. Rutman's going high. During a race, it's hard to fully appreciate how steep 31 degrees really is. But if your job is spraying asphalt primer on turns one through four at Daytona, you develop a unique appreciation for angles. You have to be very careful because you get one little rock underneath your shoe and you're going to slide. And you'll slide to the bottom because it's very steep. But the guys have a secret to staying up. It's all in the shoes. You got some guys with spikes on their baseball shoes, basically, just to help them stabilize their footing. The crew works at a fast pace, but not for long. There's a problem with the truck, and work stops. Okay, we had a hydraulic hose split right here. What this does is supplies pressure to push the oil into the hose up onto the slopes. With Lane Construction's tight schedule, any delay is costly. What you always like to see on these jobs is you want to see your mechanics sitting under a shade tree, uh, in a hammock, not doing anything, sleeping. When your mechanic is busy, then that's not a good sign on these jobs. The mechanic, Brian, quickly makes the fix. Up and running. But the whole operation costs the crew an hour of work. Now they'll have to work even harder to finish in time for tomorrow's paving job. Once the track's demolished, surveyed, graded, and primed, it's ready for asphalt. To form a smooth pavement surface, workers use a combination of liquid asphalt cement, a crude oil byproduct, and a rock and sand mix called aggregate. Together, they form asphalt concrete. It will take more than 50,000 tons of asphalt mix to build Daytona. That's the same weight as almost 30,000 NASCAR regulation cars. 
So where do you get 50,000 tons of hot asphalt? Right next to Turn 2, where Lane Constructions built a portable asphalt plant. As you can see, we're within 500 feet of this track. Uh, makes it very convenient for us to uh, get asphalt nice and hot right to the paper. Here, workers transform piles of granite rock and sand into the new surface of Daytona International Speedway. On the finished track, the rough edges of these rocks will have an immediate effect on handling. Any time that a track's repaved, uh, the, the stones and the asphalt are, are sharp, the edges are sharper, so it creates a lot more grip. And as time goes on and as cars run on it more, those edges of the stones get polished off more and, it, and it'll lose grip eventually. The pavement making process begins by dumping the rocks, called aggregate, into a feeder bin. This is the first step in making the asphalt right here, is with the feeder bins. They, they mixed four different aggregates. Two of them is sand and two of them is stone. But before the aggregate can be mixed with the liquid asphalt cement, or AC, it needs to be bone dry. All aggregate has some type of moisture in it that you gotta get out 100% or the liquid AC will not attach to the rock. The solution, heat. Inside a drying drum, a gas-powered flame heats the aggregate to 325 degrees Fahrenheit, removing any moisture. The dried aggregate moves down the drum into a mixing chamber. Inside, the aggregate mixes with the hot asphalt cement. An operator controls the whole process electronically from a booth. Once the asphalt cement and aggregate are mixed, a conveyor lifts the hot finished asphalt 60 feet into a holding tank called a batcher. It'll ask me up here in this corner if my truck is ready to load. And if it is, I hit the plus button and it automatically does the first drop on it, which is uh, about 11 tons. Every truck gets two drops of asphalt for a total load weighing over 20 tons. A cover rolls over the top to keep the asphalt hot as it heads to the track. At full tilt, this plant could make up to 350 tons of asphalt an hour. But they keep their hourly output down to 140 tons for one important reason. We can make it faster and they can lay it. But what we do, we run here to match what we're putting out there so that we can keep the plant running all the time. They can't keep up with us, and you'll see that out here. <laughs> with plenty of hot asphalt, it's time to continue on to the next stage, paving. Coming up, an obsessive vision paves the way for NASCAR glory. The drivers that showed up were just going, oh my lord, look at this. And later, a tough job gets turned on its ear, paving Daytona's 31 degree turns. Back. September 2010, deep into the historic repaving of Daytona International Speedway, Lane Construction's on site asphalt plant has pumped out thousands of tons of hot black mix the raw form of a new NASCAR battleground. But Daytona Racing's earliest days began very differently. This area is the birthplace of speed, truly. Starting in 1936, the Daytona Beach Course pitted driver against driver, racing average stock cars. It was a makeshift run on a four-mile loop of paved road and hard-packed beach. One of its earliest drivers, gas station owner Bill France Sr., was determined to organize the competition. In 1947, he co-founded the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, NASCAR. He not only realized the needs of the drivers, he also realized that he had to put on a show for the fans. Bear the horses. To increase spectator excitement, Big Bill France envisioned a grand speedway. 
He wanted the very biggest and the very best facility that had ever been built to date. He wanted to create the closest and the fastest form of competition. But to turn his vision into reality, he needed a brilliant engineer, Charles Moneypenny. Instead of a conventional oval track, Moneypenny engineered the tri-oval. This groundbreaking design would give fans a never-before-seen racing experience. For a spectator, cars on a flat raceway conceal each other when they enter the corners of the track. The plan? Elevate the turns with steep banks, as steep as possible. There was no preconceived notion that the track was going to be 31 degrees. The highest point of the banking would be in, as long as the dirt would stay up. In 1959, Daytona International Speedway was unveiled to the world for the first time. Drivers that showed up were just looking at the facility with wide deer eyes and going, oh my lord, look at this. None of them uh, had ever seen a super speedway of that magnitude. September 1st, 2010. Now, for the first time in a half century, lane construction starting from scratch. They've demolished the old pavement, surveyed and graded the rock substrate, and manufactured thousands of tons of hot asphalt right alongside the historic speedway. Now, it's time to pave. Making a road that lasts for decades requires a multi-stage plan. Water's the enemy of pavement, so the first layer is a two-inch thick open graded asphalt drainage layer. From there, the crew will add a two-inch asphalt base course. Then, a 1.5-inch layer called a leveling course. And finally, one more 1.5-inch layer known as the wearing course. Race pavement may look a lot like an average highway, but it's custom designed to endure extreme temperatures. As the cars go around the track, the tires build up heat. The way the tires dissipate that heat is by wearing rubber off the tires. When that rubber wears off the tires, it imparts more heat into the track. So we have to use a asphalt cement with an elevated softening point. It also needs to withstand completely different kinds of pressure than a standard road. Whereas a normal highway is more concerned with heavy truck traffic, what we have is a lot of lateral forces where the car wants to slide sideways through the turns. So we design our pavement mixes to have more stability. Paving a section of roads is a slow process that takes serious preparation and a ton of patience. But as lane construction reaches the first of four 31-degree curves, things are about to take a turn for the insane. Coming up, heavy-duty construction goes vertical. It's like the season opener. We'll finally get a shot at the slope here at Daytona. And later, lane construction's new Daytona gets tested. September 1st, 2010, with Daytona International Speedway demolished, surveyed, graded, and primed, Lane Constructions moved on to the next stage, paving. With plenty of hot asphalt, the job's well underway, but with a project of this scale, every day is a new challenge. Spent all day yesterday putting this prime coat on it, and uh, all the equipment is ready. Hopefully everything will go as planned. Laying down new pavement is a huge operation requiring a procession of heavy equipment called the paving train. It's called a train because all the pieces have to move in sync as they pave the track. This is where it starts, right here at this truck right here. In front, dump trucks fill a machine called a shuttle buggy with fresh asphalt. The shuttle buggy keeps the asphalt hot and stirs it to keep it from clumping. Then, the shuttle buggy funnels the hot asphalt into a crane-supported conveyor, 
which carries the asphalt to the next machine, the paver. The paver's a four-ton beast. A series of flaming jets keep the asphalt warm as a computer-controlled corkscrew-like auger evenly distributes it onto the track surface. At the back, a blade-like device called a screed smooths the asphalt into an even layer. The final machine, a compactor or roller, packs the asphalt down, creating a finished layer of pavement. Can't handle it! To get it done right, paving requires a ton of precision teamwork. But now, the lane construction crew faces an even bigger challenge. Paving Daytona's daunting 31-degree turns. During a race, gravity keeps cars glued to the track. But paving equipment's painfully slow and heavy. Conventional equipment can hold itself up up to about 18-degree banking. Once you get above about 25 degrees, then the equipment needs to be held from the top down. To keep the four-ton paver up on the steep incline, it needs some sort of anchor to hold it up. The problem? Anchors don't usually move. And this paving train needs to keep moving to do its job. The solution? A 49-ton moving anchor in the form of a Caterpillar D9 bulldozer. The compactor is lighter than the paver, so the crew anchors it with a smaller Caterpillar D8, weighing in at 40 tons. It's the same ingenious method used when the track was built back in 1958. But over the years, engineers have refined the process. What he's doing right now, he's going to hook the roller onto that mechanical arm that's attached to the bulldozer, and the bulldozer supported as we get into the turn. Need the pin? You got a pin? Suck this in, Willie. Just let that go. Suck it back in, Willie. This mechanical arm isn't something you can get at your local contractor supply store. It's custom made for the project. But the mechanical arms aren't the only thing custom made to pave the turns. To provide access for the bulldozers, Lane Construction built another road on top of the turns. Before we could even begin paving the racetrack, we had to construct basically a new road that's 4,000 feet long at each end of the track. So we had to bring in four feet of fill and place that and compact it so that we could get the bulldozers to drive at an elevation equal to the top of the wall so that the mechanical arms would work appropriately to extend over the wall and support the equipment. <laughs> angle of the road's a constant challenge, adding complexity to an already difficult task. But by the end of the day, the first layer is finished. We got the first one down and many more to go, and tomorrow will be a, another day, and uh, hopefully we can keep on making progress. Coming up. A laser precision road inspector. Will Lane's work make the grade? And later, the Daytona 500, the completely rebuilt Speedway's most critical test. September 2nd, 2010. The epic repaving of Daytona International Speedway is in full swing. From demolition, to paving. Five out of six stages are nearly complete. Over the next two months, the repave team presses on, day and night. By October 28th, Lane Construction finishes the front stretch, and NASCAR driver Tony Stewart helps paint Daytona's new finish line. By early December, close to five months after they began, Lane completes all four layers of Daytona's famous tri-oval. Amazingly, the team finishes paving a full three weeks ahead of the breakneck schedule. Now, it's time to put this track to the test. To do it, Lane uses an ordinary van with some extraordinary equipment. This is a device which is used on highway pavements around the country too to check smoothness. The van, 
drives around the track and uses laser technology to analyze the surface based on a theoretical neutral axis and then measures deviations in that pavement surface either above or below that axis. The difference in our specification is we have a much tighter tolerance than what you get on most highway pavements. Thankfully, after months of backbreaking work, the new track passes its first test with flying colors. Next up, a test that's slightly less technical, but way more thrilling. December 16th, 2010. Sponsored by Goodyear, this test is about more than track smoothness. Zooming around turns, these cars are testing a new batch of Goodyear tires. The exclusive tire maker for NASCAR, Goodyear formulates tires specifically for almost every individual track. Every track has a little bit different characteristics. The pavement might be slightly different, the bank angles, the speeds that the cars run, just to propose different handling characteristics. Now that Daytona has new pavement, Goodyear's designed a new tire, specifically for the new Daytona. The track itself is going to create a lot of grip, so we don't have to worry too much about providing grip from the tires themselves. We just want to create a nice, comfortable, stable platform and make sure we can dissipate the heat and generate a little bit of tire wear. At each turn, Lane Construction's immaculate racing surface proves itself, taking the cars to new speeds. Experienced NASCAR drivers knew the old Daytona like the back of their hands. Now, it's a whole new ball game. You almost couldn't hold it wide open before, lap after lap, leading the draft, even. You'd have to lift a little bit because your car would slide out from under you. Now, it's not going to be like that. You can just hold it wide open, and you have to look in the mirror a lot more than you used to to, to block guys and see guys coming, and see runs, and, and judge that better than before. Coming up, the Super Bowl of stock car racing on the completely reconstructed Super Speedway. After five months of construction, from demolition to final testing, building the Daytona International Speedway is a monumental project that's guaranteed to go down in history nearly one and a half million square feet of paving success. We all knew if we stuck around long enough, this day would come. <laughs> but for some, just standing on the track isn't enough. Shall we see what the Camaro can do? Hammer down. All right, here we go. unbelievably smooth and if we were doing this on the old surface we'd be jostling around and bumping and dipping and I'd probably not be talking to you because I'd be a little more nervous driving around the track we just went through that turn at 105 miles per hour in a production Camaro so now we're up to 120 I've got my hand off the wheel which I probably shouldn't have we're up to 130 and it's just smooth as glass this is as good as it gets. Come to the start finish line. There we go. Victory. Finally, it's time for the pros to show how it's done. The flag waves, and the Daytona 500 is on. Tearing through turns, drafting tight, and pulling position. Everything's changed completely different. Uh, the track, they did a great job. You didn't even need to bring a notebook from years past. It's a huge difference from what it was in 2010. It's just sheer speed, as much drag as you can get out of the car. So basically, we just put gas in and go. From the stands in the booth, the Lane construction team watches with pride. What a, you know, an experience it was to be here to pave the Daytona Speedway and to see these cars driving like they are and going as fast as they're going, it's just incredible, incredible. It's NASCAR's most famous track. 
now completely reconstructed. A track rebuilt for traction, rebuilt for endurance, and rebuilt for speed. Speedmakers, Daytona.